but it's it's emblematic on a small scale, right? People look at Ukraine and Russia and say, "Look, we're this is this is this is showing us what modern war looks like. It's drone warfare." Well, I think that's showing us what the future of these policies that we have is going to look like. Right. So, yeah. So do we want to live in a world where every rich nation is surrounded by an intensely <laughs> militarized border or not? You know, and like that seems like the direction things are heading in, in, in Europe, at least, um, you know, our southern border is. Well, this is one of the interpretations of zombie flicks. Exactly. Right, right, right. That, that's that, that, the imagery that, that comes to mind. That's yeah. the imagery that comes to yeah. mind. And that, yeah. that's one of the interpretations. And this is the doomsday imagery that has driven so much of the sort of Bannon. Uh, what's that fuck face's name? Miller. Miller. Uh, you know, over the past. <laughs> Came right to yeah, mind. Six years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what that guy looks like? He, he looks like, um, he looks like a, 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 a shaved rat's asshole. <laughs> You know, that's it's, it's he's a shaved rat's asshole and he's got that little tail, you know, kind of like, you know, anything. <laughs> I think the term cartoonishly evil was was made for that guy. It's, yeah. It's unbelievable how evil the dude looks. Yeah. But with a shaved rat's asshole. Yeah. Premiering as a kind of scare bit in the middle of the cartoon. It's like, you know, it's like a transformer and then subliminal a, message. That guy, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like Dr. Robotnik, you know, like yeah. Stephen Miller, but then Dr. Robotnik is riding on a giant machine made of rats assholes. <laughs> that's that's what I imagine Stephen Miller as. Welcome back to the second episode of 10 billion people. Now, on the prior episode, uh we had been called coming to America. We also had some other names. But importantly, it was listed as 10 billion people. So we are now sticking with that name. My name is Damien DeNoble, and this is Eli McDonald. And uh, on this show, we talk about the most important issue in the world, which is the movement of people between countries, within countries. It is the most politically salient issue that we have. And we are going to be going up to 10 billion people you know, by, by about 2054, by the mid-2050s at any rate. And if we don't figure this out, issues of immigration are just going to get so much harder to deal with. And we don't have a good way to talk about them yet. We have too localized of a debate in every country. And we don't realize that actually many of the problems that accompany immigration are problems that need to be solved everywhere, probably at the same time. And hopefully, we'll be talking to experts on the show. We will be talking to people in the know we will be talking to about other folks you might want to listen to. For the time being, it's just the two of us. I'm an immigration lawyer. Eli is a law student, soon to be immigration lawyer, who will be working here next year. He's been working with me for two years, and he has lots and lots and lots of really cool immigration experience. And on today's show, we are talking about Nikola Jokic in the second half, because on every show, we talk about Somebody that you know well, Nikola Jokic, two-time NBA MVP from the city of Sombor in northern Serbia. We're going to look at his kind of immigration background, what it may or may not say about him. But in the first half, Eli, we are talking what? We're talking European Union. We're talking and European Union. And the migration crisis, as it has been called. Okay, the migration crisis of 2022, right? Because there have been several. Right. So take us through this. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a big topic. It's a big topic. Um, most of us became aware of this in the 2014s, 15s, um, as, as the Syrian civil war um, exploded. And um, the famous picture, the toddler on the beach in Greece. Yeah, three-year-old um, toddler, yeah. Heartbreaking. Yeah, heartbreaking shot. Um, and it really snapped the world's uh, attention to this issue, I think. Um, yeah, he was face was, down in the sand, little shorts, t-shirt that every parent in the world could yeah. understand every sibling could understand yeah if you if you've seen that picture you won't forget it it's similar to the one on the u.s border um yeah. of the father and his uh father and his daughter um yeah so the world in 2014-15 there was a huge response people flocked to greece to help um and initially, they were received uh, really well in Greece. They were working together with local authorities. They were hailed as uh, Europe's finest, um, you know, really like 
embodying these humanitarian traits that we that we um, associate with Europe and yeah. um, the European Union. The Greeks were. The Greeks were hailed as Europe's finest and the volunteers helping the immigrants or who was ha- hailed as the finest? The the volunteers flooding in, mm-hmm. flooding in. I mean, I think I think early on. Famously, Marc Gasol. Oh, really? We are big NBA fans on this show. So most of my reference, Marc Gasol was down there in his off season from the Memphis Grizzlies wow. helping people on the islands. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think really quickly local governments realized they couldn't do this on their own. Um, so the huge influx of NGOs and um, and aid workers initially were hailed as um, super necessary. Um, and then pretty quickly it soured. Um, there, there's a really amazing story that I came across during doing research for this um, of two young 20-something aid workers who flew to Lesbos, um, and worked with a really which tiny, is one of the islands, one of the islands in Greece. Um, a- approximately nine thousand residents, and I think at the peak in twenty fourteen fifteen, there were up to five hundred thousand people coming in um, every couple months um, six, to Lesbos. To Lesbos, six six thousand, half a million to- lesbians. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's in the world. Anyway, <laughs> did that throw you off? <laughs> um. I'm sorry. So this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a lawyer. Please keep going. Um, a million lesbians a month being newly created by immigration. Yeah, and they're welcoming people with open Amazing. arms. Um, and these two, these two aid workers um, were essentially, you know, doing what what twenty something year old aid, aid workers do: passing out blankets on the shore, as alerting authorities when uh, when migrant boats were coming in. Um, and then, to make a long story short, out of nowhere, um, they were arrested and now face. 25 years of peace in prison for their work there. 25 um, years of peace? 25 years of peace in prison. Peace. So so a quarter decade each in prison. Is that would be the greatest right prison on earth. It's like you are sentenced to 25 years of peace. That would be not, well. Is that Denmark? Who, who has the famously, yeah, uh, one of the Scandinavian countries, like, one of the Scandinavian here's your beautiful countries. room. Here's some wooden blocks to play with. Get out exactly. your rage. Please put the knives back in the knife block in the yeah. kitchen when you're yeah. done. Leave yeah. when you want. But do come back. We'd like to see you often. Yeah. I mean, the programming is great. I think they do come back. They do come back. often. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just just an amazing story. And it's emblematic of this shift there. Um, there was a lot of tension rising up as people... Um, Greece was already struggling at this point. Um, economically, um, all these, you know, young aid workers came in. They're bringing their lifestyle with them. You know, they're... Um, you know, they're doing the same work as the locals there. The locals in Greece initially were giving shoes off their feet, um, you know, really stepped up. And then over time, had you know, given what they what they could. And then, you know, right wing media. And then, and then we realized that the uh, 2008 crash hurt Greece more than any other European country and that this wasn't sustainable. Right. 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 And then and this the, this little yeah. vacuum opens for the media there. Um, they started publishing the salaries of aid workers. They started you know, looking at these NGOs in a, in a totally different light. Is this the um, Golden Dawn ecosystem? Is this the time of Golden Dawn kind of rising up after the crash? Right? The Golden Dawn is kind of that neo-Nazi, not kind of, they ex- explicitly, explicitly neo-Nazi, neo-Nazi yeah. party, right? Yeah. And coming up. Yeah. So they, they were one of the ones who that played a part in Giannis's story that we did in the last yeah. pod. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. He was hiding from, from, from Golden Dawn supporters in the streets, maybe yeah. even during this time. Cause I forget, or no, when did he come into the NBA? 2014, maybe. Yeah, it probably was right around yeah, this time. So, so right yeah. around this time, he's he's kind of there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, Greece Greece is emblematic of the shift in like Europe's uh, perception of this, and um, yeah, basically the, these far right parties uh, took it and ran with it. And before long, um, you know, we'll get into this a little bit later, but populism starts exploding all all over the continent. Um, and it's it's interesting to step back a little bit before we really dive in and um, think about what Europe is. You know, it's the cradle of of human rights. Um, it's where a lot of refugee protections were uh, born, essentially. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so we're looking at what they stand for internally, and then they're operating these just human meat grinders of borders. You know, and in every direction. You don't um, have an opinion on this or anything. Meat grinders of borders. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Let, let me stop you. So one thing that, that you, you have here that's really interesting is that uh, you, you, you posed the question right on that is like, how has it happened that the Mecca of human rights now operates the most violent and militarized borders in the world? Right. Are they more militarized than we are? 
I, I think it's pretty well established that the Spain-Morocco border, specifically that we'll go into, is the most violent uh, and militarized in the world. Um, and then looking at migrant deaths, the, the Mediterranean also. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's... Uh, Don't mind me. I'm just taking notes as you talk. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it creates this really interesting... Um, dichotomy for for citizens of europe and citizens of the world especially you know even the u.s we look to um we look to europe for uh for guidance on on refugee and asylum rights on on human rights in general um so you know so is europe actually perpetuating these rights at their borders um and can they really um like these ideals these are ideals they, are they perpetuating these ideals okay right right um I think looking at at why people migrate, we don't have to spend spend long on this. Um, we can spend as long as we like. It's, it's our podcast, and people that's are listening. True. That's true. I have some questions <laughs> already for you. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Go go with the questions first. Well, I, here's you said something super interesting. I I want to I don't want to go back too far uh, because I think you want to talk about you know what in the, in the notes here you have you you want to go take a second to consider why people migrate, right? That's the question you're, you're going to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do we want to talk about that? I mean, that, that's the question you're really asking. It's like, if they know that this meat grinder exists, even in the most idyllic, you know, idealistic societies on earth that come to my, when it comes to migration, which is in Europe. Right. Yeah. Um, idealistic. We didn't say best. Nobody sent me an email saying that I'm in, in the idealistic then why are people still migrating knowing that all of these difficulties exist? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, really from, from my perspective, that could be answered to the EU specifically. Right. 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 And I, I think if you take a few minutes and, and look into these people's stories, there's no single answer. You know, there's intellectuals uh, from Cameroon who've gone through every, you know, to the highest echelons of academia in that country and can't find, um, ways to support their family. There's um, people escaping starvation. There's people escaping political violence. Um, so it's not a, a homogenous group, and there's not one reason. But there's multiple. Um, there's multiple reasons they come, and um, I think there's a tendency to, you know, to look at it as one as as one large group uh, when they arrive at the border, um, which just isn't the case. I think. This is a tough uh, topic for English speakers to wrap their head around, particularly in the U.S. where we're filming, because so many different country names are involved in so many different languages. Right. And so somebody listening, you say, okay, well, here are um, EU, the EU. Entry into the EU has several established routes. Right. You'd mentioned uh, this. Uh, you'd mentioned Morocco. Mm-hmm. Right. We've sort of touched on the fact that people are coming through the Western Balkans, mm-hmm. which the Western Balkans, for those who don't know, is considered to be Croatia, Slovenia, Hungary, Bosnia, Serbia. You know, then you're already getting to the Eastern Balkans. Yeah. Which I don't understand. That's just how the economist defines it. Um, and then you have routes across the Mediterranean to Italy. Right. Right. And then not so much routes that, that, that go around more north anymore. There used to be an older route that would kind of take people all the way north to the coast of France. And, mm. you know, um, but what happens is these routes change over time and there's different country entry points. And every country in Europe has a different amount of resources that they can commit to the policing of migrants or to the hosting of migrants, right. and they have very different politics towards them. So you're right. dealing with what were created explicitly as nation, ethnic nation states in most ca- most cases, right? The number of ethnicities within the countries, you know, varies. Uh, the French, uh, you know, had several languages, uh, but whereas you know, a smaller country like the Portuguese just had Portuguese, right? You know, it varies, but uh, the point is that they are very autonomous. Right. And so uh, what's happening is after these kind of 2014 to 2016 waves of migrants, which brought by some counts over 3 million migrants into the EU uh, very quickly, is we have had a rebuilding of borders in Europe. Yep. So again, going back just a little bit in history, Europe had been working previous to that for 30 years to get rid of its borders, to make the flow of people much easier. Right. That changed completely the economies of places uh, like Britain. It changed completely the economies of France, Germany. It brought in cheap labor from places like Poland, from places right. like the former Yugoslavia republics, from Africa, from Northern Africa in particular. And now, 
after these uh, migrants uh, came in because of these deep humanitarian crises um, in Syria, other parts of Asia, uh, combined with the ongoing flow of folks from Northern Africa, don't forget Libya kind of crashed. Right. You have militarized borders and you have a lot of anger towards migrants. We saw in the following six years since 2016, how the United States, particularly people like Steve Bannon, jumped on these events to foment xenophobia in these, you know, in other places like the United States. Right. And so now we're looking at a country, uh, we're looking at a new immigration crisis, quote unquote, where a uh, flow of migrants is resuming at about 85,000 people per month. Right. Trying to it's, enter it's the It's creeping EU. right back up to the 2014, 2015 levels. 2014, yeah. 2015 yeah. levels. And so everybody's kind of th- trying to figure out, well, what happens now? Right. Um, you can't go through certain parts. Like all the Balkan republics have kind of put up borders. Hungary is not letting anybody through. Yeah. Right. Um, there is uh, ongoing enforcement at sea. But other things are happening too, and that's that's the part of the story that that you're looked at and that you're looking at. But one thing that um, is really happening that um, is fascinating is that countries are entering into agreements with other countries outside of the EU to take immigrants en masse and ship them over. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, and I think there's two other uh, small points that are really interesting. So after 2014, 2015, as you mentioned, um, the EU poured billions of dollars into its borders, into uh, Frontex, which is the agency that that operates its borders. And they lauded, I think it was a 67% decrease in the next three or four years. So on paper, this is a huge success for them. Yeah. Um, But what we're seeing now and what most people are reporting is it didn't stem the flow, it redirected the flow and just further um, immiserated the people on these routes. It's like squeezing the balloon. Exactly. It's 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 like the water goes... Exactly. This is a balloon. Exactly. And then the second factor now is these uh, numbers are creeping back up. We have the war in Ukraine. We have um, five million migrants. Yeah, have gone to Poland, and some number of IDPs, internally displaced persons. Yeah. Right, and just and just um, a lack of attention because of other um, huge issues in in Europe. Um, so you think you know if another photo came out of of a toddler on a beach, would would there be the same reaction? I think the answer is answer is really no. Uh, is that yeah, people don't seem to quite have the bandwidth now, um, and and but also politics has changed, right? So, yeah. so Danish politics in particular, since the late nineteen nineties, with the rise of new parties mm-hmm. that were seen originally as being too far right, um, have created um, a new political uh, status quo, yeah. which is to be very harsh on immigration yeah. and to be highly national. Uh, nationalistic in one's approach to handing out specifically immigration benefits. Yeah. Because there's been this longstanding fear in European countries, which have been much more socialist um, in the way that they hand out benefits to their people. It's right. part of the, it's one of the compromises. One of the reasons you form an ethno national state is the idea that all your people of your ethn- ethnicity and nationality are going to benefit from. Yeah. The government services. And so the, one of the great fears of Europeans that um, politicians found they could prey on is that, well, these immigrants are going to come in and they're going to take from you what's really yours. Right. There's I mean, not the, enough of the pie to go around. And both the liberals and, it look, you know, have, have shifted what we would say in the U.S. right, though I know that that's a limited concept, but they've shifted to a much more conservative, much more hardline stance on immigration than they were 20 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah, I think all all parties have been have been pulled to the right. Um, and something that kept popping up in the in the rhetoric of these of these far right parties um, is great replacement theory, which is now, you know, a yeah. huge buzzword in the yeah. in the US. But that was really I mean, I'm sure that's existed longer, but that was born as a buzzword um, in 2015 um, yeah. af- after um, after this initial initial surge. Um, what, what is the great replacement theory? I, I you know. It was, there were political parties. Because I told you about it first. Because I I sent it and I said, we should call our podcast Replace Me Greatly. And you were like, why? I was like, oh, because the great replacement theory, we want to make fun of that. You know, we want to make fun of the Nazis. I I just didn't think people who believed in it would quite quite see it. You don't (laughs) think, unfortunately. You don't think it, because my point is, I, great replacement theory says what? Great, that, that our, uh, sacred 
identity as a nation is going to be replaced by these uh, hordes of, of human beings coming in with their own cultures, identities. So as a law professor might say, let's unpack that. Our great identity as a nation, who is included in the definition of our? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, who's included in the definition of hordes? And hordes is the word that's used in this, right? So this stems in part from- One of the better words. Uh, a French, right? One of the better yeah. words. Yeah. Yeah. Better than uh, trash, hordes, right? Vermin, Vermin. You know, any an, any animal. Uh, yeah, yeah. The hordes is hordes is one of yeah. the better ways. One of the better ways. Yeah. yeah the the rise in populism. Uh, the you know the response to the originally uh, humanitarian ideals. Yeah. That, that to you know that were initially. Uh, yeah. The, the initial reaction was a humanitarian one yeah. across Europe. So I think that's where we got here, and then um, the backlash, the okay. populism. So here's what's interesting to me. Okay. Um, what's interesting to me, and, and I include Ukraine in this, is that there is always with these events, when the initial images come out of people suffering in Ukraine, you had that family of four that was just hit by a bomb blast while crossing a bridge. We already talked about the Syrian uh, child. We talked about the, the, the couple at the border in the United States, children in cages. Right. Um, the, the pictures from Afghanistan when America evacuated last year, from my perspective, what happens is that the law office gets a call. People saying, we want to help. I want to help. Where's the resources? Who do I go to? I want to give money. Like, what do I do? How can I volunteer? And I was that person for a long time, right? Yeah. Before I was a lawyer, yeah. even a young lawyer was like, where can I go? Where can I volunteer? And arguably the first four years of my career, we're just doing that, <laughs> trying to figure it out. And then it fades. Right. And then it fades. Right. And uh, what gets left in people's minds is that, number one, they want to help the children. Maybe they want to help the young families. There's this other persistent thing that, that kind of sticks there. Nobody talks about the men. Mm -hmm. But paradoxically, only the men from that point on who are like attacking barricades or sleeping in camps are shown. Right. And then you have this flip. Then you have politicians, leaders, voices who come on. They're like, okay, that was bad, but like, we're about to be invaded. Like you guys realize that it's like two or 3 million people. And suddenly that story of the boy on the beach no longer matters because now people are coming to your neighborhoods. Right? Yeah. And what you realize is compassion's not enough. Passion, movement, activism, picking up phones, donating money, that doesn't solve this issue. Right. Arguably, and uh, my progressive colleagues might uh, disagree, it doesn't help. Arguably, it hurts things. Whenever you sensationalize any of it, maybe a nonprofit gets millions of dollars. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe there's, there's a golden dawn for nonprofits who come in and do this work early. Yeah. But they're not big enough or organized not to do it for a long time, except a few, right? And they're certainly not big enough to solve the problem. And so the only thing that remains in people's minds, cycle after cycle, is, oh, this is still happening. Oh, these people are still dying. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give to this child. But also, oh, this is still happening. Right. Is that a threat to me? And, and, and oftentimes these, these groups get accused of being pull factors. You know, yeah. really effective hmm. NGOs um, are accused by uh, by the right of being the cause of these deaths in a lot of ways, because the more effectively they operate, the more people they uh, pluck out of the Mediterranean, um, the more people feel safe coming. And that's yeah, and, and I that's, think that's horseshit. I, I, I absolutely I, I, think I, I, that's horseshit. But, so, yeah. so, so let's talk about why people come. Okay, so then there's this. So we ask, what would Europe do today? And there's this great instructive example. Okay, so in 2018. Okay, 2018, Serbia, okay, Serbia says, let me check my notes, it says that they are revo rewarding, essentially, the country of Burundi. The poorest in the world. The poorest country in the world. An average uh, uh, GDP per person of $247. Yes. 200, you can't buy a PlayStation 3 for that. Yeah. Maybe you can as a PlayStation 4 now. The wrong person to ask. I was raised by yeah. old hippies. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> and so they say, okay, Burundi can now have visas issued 
to come to Serbia. And in taking this action, there's an immediate political implication, and Serbia just comes out and says it. This is because Burundi revoked its recognition of Kosovo as an independent country. Right. Kosovo, Serbia has maintained as a province of Serbia, uh, and it's only been recognized uh, as a province by like Russia. The U.S. recognizes Kosovo as a country. It's a whole thing. Yeah. And what happens is that Burundi, which pours country in the world, but also after its 2015 election, there was uh, a resulting exile from the country of hundreds of thousands. So it has a huge problem with refugees outside the country. It has a huge internal displaced persons program. Well, people start getting on planes to come visit Serbia. Yeah. And then they end up entering the rest of the United, the EU. Right. The number, but there's a phenomenon. This is a phenomenon. This goes to why NGOs aren't the pull factor. Okay. Yeah. There's a phenomenon here, which is asylum applications in Serbia for people in Burundi start going up from two to 134. Why is this important? It's important because it's not being driven by NGOs, but as a wonderful article by an independent reporter called Sasha Dragoilo shows, I read Serbo Croatian, so I get to read this stuff. Um, they're Burundians themselves, right, who come to the opportunists who come into Serbia, start putting out this rumor that you can, uh, you pay them and they get you asylum in the country. And so it's like two mm. or 3,000 euros. People hop on planes, they get to Serbia, and those folks who are asking for asylum, they go to jail, mm. straight to jail. But here's what this illustrates to me. If anyone is to blame for being opportunists and being a pull factor, it's actually organized crime. Hmm. Because here's the thing. Migration, whenever there's migration from a poor country to a richer country, from a country that's in turmoil to a country that's more stable, you always, it's somebody trying to take advantage fairly, the person themselves, of arbitrage of opportunity between their country and a different country. Yeah, yeah. and. Always, there are middlemen who step in and try to monetize that. Right. That's why every immigration policy in the world, one of its top three issues is always, how do we make sure to cut down on smuggling? 100%. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then that becomes a justification for increased border security and visa controls. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think it's the NGOs. I actually think that it's built and baked into the system that there's a pull factor yeah. by the system of nation states. Okay. So as soon as you have borders, there's going to be arbitrage opportunities, right? In movement, right? Again, whether sure. it's for stability or money. Now, Damon wants to abolish all borders. No, I don't at all. What I'm saying is it's not a problem that can be solved between country A and country B. If country A is poorer than country B, people from country A are always going to come to country, want to come to country B. They're going to want to stay there, right? And then country B will be illogical for them under if they can't afford to bring those people in for them to let them in. So you have to expand the net. Yeah. It's a collective problem. It can only be solved by the entire world working together. Right. What's going to happen if India's temperature goes up to 160 degrees in the summer in New Delhi? Went up to 140. Yeah. What happens if it goes to 160? Yeah. What happens if you have 200 million people that need to move? Right. What happens if you have 2 billion people that need to move because of climate change? Is it going to be like, well, uh, no, Hungary's got it. Right. Lesbos. Right. Lesbos can, Harry, can, can, uh, can uh, do this. You know, right. Like we're going to put this on Lesbos. No, it's completely crazy. So it's kind of shifting it from uh, thinking about it as a series of single events and a series of single issues into a more permanent state that we need to think on more um, existential levels about how we want to deal with. Absolutely. If you just talk about immigration in terms of borders and people's reactions to new neighbors and about uh, poor, tragic, dead children on the beach and dead bodies on fences. Yeah. You are looking at the forest. 
Yeah, absolutely. Wait, are you looking at the trees? You're missing the forest for the trees. Been out of law school too yeah, long. Yeah, you're good. Thank you. <laughs> you're missing the forest for the trees. And we need to think about the ecology of the forest, which is really the ecology of our societies. America is unique in that above it is Canada and the Arctic. Yeah. On its east coast is the Atlantic Ocean. On its west coast, the Pacific. Uh, and even though there's plenty of legal immigration through Canada, there are not thousands of people that come through right. there because they have right. kind of nowhere to eh, they fly in and you have kind of periodic trickles. Yeah. The closest thing we have to European problem is on the Southern border. And even that is not as unique because you have this small little strip of land that everybody has to walk up. Yeah. Um, and some people get on both on these lanchas, right. From, from Cuba. Like we saw 19 people, how many people died on that Cuba thing? Five, last week? five known, uh, died off the Florida Keys a, a few weeks ago uh, in, a, like in a boat of 19. Yeah, yeah. very right yeah. so that, yeah. that's like a Mediterranean like type phenomenon right but but just right. happening right here in, in the Gulf of Mexico. But in Europe they have many countries. They have many entry points. And it makes no sense to think of this as a border to border issue. No. And those nonprofits they are just plugging holes and it's just good people trying to do the best they can, but they're actually powerless. Their, their contribution to the pull factor is zilch. Absolutely. It's zilch. It is. Yeah. And I, th I think, uh, I mean, when, when Serbia struck this deal, they became the only country in Europe that Burundians could travel to. Yeah. And, and I think what this story speaks of to me is just how pressurized the system is. Um, yeah. And, um, it was like taking yeah, and, the and top off a pressure cooker. Exactly. And point, pointing to small, like destination country factors, like you said, just it, it doesn't add up if, if you look into it. Well, here, here's, here's another logical kind of thing. Are, is anybody saying that the folks from Burundi are staying in Serbia? Yeah. No, 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 no. Because Serbia is one of the poorest countries in the EU. Yep. Right. So come to Serbia. Okay. There's a much better kind of more economic stability, more stability going elsewhere. Yeah. Right. And that's where you go. Yeah. Cause you're looking for the best opportunity, right? People in Serbia don't stay in Serbia. I say that as a Serbian Croatian, like people <laughs> don't stay there, but they came into Serbia. So is it the nonprofits pulling them in? No. In fact, the nonprofits in Serbia, those good men and women are going to airports and making sure that these Burundi folks who are being detained because they're coming on false asylum promises aren't being mistreated and thrown into jails where right. war criminals once stood. So I think what I see that is um, important here is a structural orientation towards immigration. I don't blame individuals who come. Yeah. And if you talk to somebody that has plans to like, if you talk to Australian uh, conservatives, who devised this kind of Christmas island? What's what's that island called? Where they, uh, you have it in the notes here. That, mm. but Christmas Island is like is like one of the names, like for for like this one of the original detention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the original. If if you talk to the Australians who 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 ship who keep their migrants locked up on like a single island, don't let them come in. If you talk to the Danes who want to send people to Papua New Guinea, to or Republic of Nauru, Republic of Nauru. Yeah, that's what yeah. it is, Nauru. Yeah. Um. If you talk to them, they would say, well, we don't blame the people either, but we want to show the people that they can't just come here. We want to make it more expensive. Never right. mind that holding people on Nauru is much more expensive than processing them in the country. Never mind that. Right. Um, you can't blame the people. And it's not enough to look at the country like you look at a country like Burundi and say, well, they're poor. Let's, let's make it easier to like make money. Like, let's invest in that. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's, let's try to solve the push factor of that country being poor. That's not enough either. Right. What I'm saying is no matter what you do under our current system of nation states, there's going to exist an arbitrage opportunity. And unless you gouge people's eyes out and you chop off their ears and pierce their eardrums so that they can't hear the radio, so that they can't watch TikTok, so they, they can't see how well they can have it in the rest of the world. That arbitrage opportunity is always going to be desired. Yeah. And it's something that we have to take account of. Now, we've been lucky in the sense that we've had a period where agricultural yields have gone up. 
all over the world for the past 50 years. We, we, in the seventies, we were thinking we couldn't even feed the right, world. Right. Right. And we've had a relatively slow period of growth in like large pockets of the world that's been able to absorb a lot of immigration and needed it. We're about to enter a period where climate change on the coast where most people live is going to push, is going to create a true push factor. Right. Right. And I, I think these like intermediary steps that, that European countries are take, that's how I really see these uh, third country agreements. It's like they don't want to deal with the, uh, with the deep conflict that we're talking about here. If, you know, who are we as uh, a nation, a group of nations? How do we want to treat these individuals? Um, they, they're kind of pushing it off. They're kind of like pushing it away from their borders a little bit, allowing some of the human rights atrocities to be meted out by, um, you know, Morocco's police force in, instead of Spain. Um, so it's really denying the inevitable. We have to answer that question eventually as a globe, I think. Um, and I, I really feel like it's just uh, putting it off uh, what, a lot, what a lot of European countries are doing uh, with these agreements. Well, I, think, I think ultimately it's going to lead to some really, really horrific scenes. And I'm hoping that the same pattern of, oh my God, that's horrific. Oh, let's help. And then just like get tired. No. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and I mean, if, if, if any of these borders is going to kind of lead, lead more people to that, that realization, it has to be the Spain Morocco border. Um, what's happening is, there? What's what's the story there? The the story there has been ongoing. Um, basically, migrants uh, group in these in these forests. So there there's two Spanish cities in Morocco, Melilla um, and Cuenta. I, th I think I may be pronouncing the second one wrong. Um, and I think back before Morocco had declared its independence, there's Spain has held on to these two cities through thick and thin. Um, and what's happening now is basically the, the border that they've built around Malia is the most uh, violent militarized in the world. It's essentially six lines of defense. Um, they've worked out agreements with, with Morocco. So the Moroccan police um, are the first line, all the way through to the Spanish uh, Guardia Civil on the other side. And essentially migrants are, they've developed this tactic uh, where they wait in kind of the hills surrounding Malia. Um, and then charge the border by the thousands, um, at best, or the hundreds or thousands. Um, and I think there, there was one interview I, I saw where, you know, if, if 500 people start out, 50 will touch that last fence and two or three will get through. Mm -hmm. um, all the while with the uh, Moroccan and Spanish uh, police forces cracking skulls, you know, uh, aiming for hands and feet so people can't climb, um, just like un unimaginable. Uh, atrocity on those borders um and it's been going like this for years for years um and i mean i can't i can't imagine a more um a more hopeless uh chance at crossing <laughs> you know just like pouring yourself against this militarized fence um do you think but it's it's emblematic on a small scale right people look at ukraine and russia and say look we're this is this is this is showing us what modern war looks like it's drone warfare well, I think that's showing us what the future of these policies that we have is going to look like. Right. So, yeah. So do we want to live in a world where every rich nation is surrounded by an intensely <laughs> militarized border or not? You know, and like that seems like the direction things are heading in, in, in Europe, at least, um, you know, our southern border is. Well, this is one of the interpretations of zombie flicks. Exactly. Right, right, right. That, 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 that's the imagery that, that comes to mind. That's yeah. the imagery that comes to yeah. mind. And that, yeah. that's one of the interpretations. And this is the doomsday imagery that has driven so much of the sort of Bannon. Uh, what's that fuck face's name? Miller. Miller. Uh, <laughs> you know, over the past. <laughs> Came right to yeah, mind. <laughs> six years. Yeah. Yeah. You know what that guy looks like? He, he looks like, um, he looks like a, 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 a shaved rat's asshole. <laughs> You know, that's it's, it's he's a shaved rat's asshole and he's got that little tail, you know, kind of like, you know, you think. <laughs> I think the term cartoonishly evil was was made for that guy. It's, yeah. It's unbelievable how evil the dude looks. Yeah. But with a shaved rat's asshole. Yeah. Premiering as a kind of scare bit in the middle of the cartoon. It's like, you know, it's like a transformer and then subliminal a, message. That guy, yeah. you know, yeah, he's, yeah. it's like Dr. Robotnik, you know, yeah. Stephen Miller, but then Dr. Robotnik is riding on a giant machine made of rats assholes. <laughs> that's 
That's what I imagine Stephen Miller as. Rats, assholes of immigrant origin, I must add. Yeah. If we're talking about his family, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They're yeah. a bunch of assholes of immigrant origin. Yeah. Now, everybody's like, feel bad for Stephen Miller's family. I'm like, no, no, I, I'm not. No, no, I'm blaming the family here. He didn't just like wake up one day in high school and was like, you know what? I'm going to go give a, a speech demonizing uh, my Mexican classmates. That's what I'd love to do. I, ju- I just don't think. I mean, you grew, he is supposedly from a liberal Jewish family, Eli. Yeah. So he is a, a supposedly, but I never bought that. Uh, but given the fact that today that we're filming is post uh, Kanye on Alex Jones day, I really don't want to go around blaming Jewish families for anything. Fair. Okay. I just, I feel, I feel really disgusted at how mainstream um, anti-Semitism has become. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I think before we move on, an yeah. interesting tidbit um, legally is how um, European laws and international laws are just being forget forgotten at a at a rapid pace at these borders. Oh, there's, what's happening? There's tons and tons of um, video footage reporting um, of this Moroccan border um, of illegal pushback. So basically, under EU law, still once your feet touch soil, um, you're supposed to have an interpreter. Um, uh, legal representative of some sort um, and a few other protections. Um, and that's not happening at all. There's, there's a video I saw um, of a literal door in the, in the border fence, kind of near, um, near where the border wall hits the Mediterranean in Malia. Yeah. Um, and border guards walking, unlocking the door and just unceremoniously like batoning people back through um, hmm. into Morocco, which is completely illegal. Um, and Spain actually did in 2014, they tried to change a law legalizing it, essentially illegalizing these or legalizing these uh, pushbacks. Um, and it's still, there's still kind of this ongoing fight. Um, because it's still illegal under under EU law, um, but, but Spain is basically. Um, but, but how many how many reports of that do you get from Customs and Border Patrol and and from Mexican border oh, border yeah. officials? Yeah, yeah, right. I, it's 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 don't see if you don't see it like it didn't happen. Um, right, and so that's always going to be a part of it, right? It's all it's all like very messy and and ugly. But yeah. we didn't finish the Burundi example, right? So mm. 2018. Serbia lets in Burundis with visas. Well, what happened this October? They ended the program because Serbia came under immense European pressure. um, And European officials were arguing that this was now a security threat. To the rest of Europe. To the rest of Europe. Um, And they were using, even leveraging the Ukraine war as a reason that this should be turned off. Right. And at the same time that this is happening, right, there's been all these like intermingling things like um, the rise of mafias across the continent in Europe that are trafficking in people and drugs. And it was even said that this makes those stronger because some of them are thought to come from Serbia. Um, And so what seems like on the surface, a pretty, I don't know, like a harmless thing, just letting in, letting a country get a visa. Right. Right. To come to Serbia, letting some very small country run to get a became a major issue. Right. 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 And it wasn't, and I, to be clear, it wasn't domestic political pressure that led to the closing. Right. It wasn't domestic political pressure. Although I haven't had enough time to search, I would guess knowing, uh, knowing, uh, the people from my region of the world that I, I, I don't think they were, there were too many happy faces when Burundi people from Burundi walk around Belgrade. Because yeah. I know how they reacted to when China China uh, used to smuggle people through Bosnia, through Serbia, oh, excuse okay. me. Interesting. There used to be 50,000 Chinese that lived in Belgrade around the 2000s, right? And they were all mm. being smuggled to workshops. So it's, 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 a, it's an ongoing thing. All right. So we had a very far-ranging discussion without any conclusions. Uh, folks, if you're looking for an academic discussion, this is not your channel. We're really trying to touch on it. Uh, we are really trying to kind of highlight things for you, trying to make it somewhat entertaining. Um, but we are going to go into a second part of our podcast. Okay. And this ties in, this ties in because, um, in the second part of our podcast, we always talk about somebody famous, um, and what their immigration story is. And today, and they're usually going to be a sports athlete of some sort, because we're just two dudes. (laughs) We're just two dudes in a field dominated by women. I have to point out 90% of immigration lawyers are women and they will tell you themselves. They are better at this job than men. They'll tell you that themselves. You don't have to ask me. 
ask any female lawyer what they think of male lawyers. So we're pushing back yeah. on stereotypes by only talking about sports figures. That's right. And yeah. by not having precise academic notes on any subject of note that we discuss. We are totally proving these women wrong <laughs> and uh, about being unprepared. Okay. Nikola Jokic, the practitioner of the Sambor Shuffle, the man who can pirouette into a one footed, left handed fadeaway from the corner without leaving the ground. And looking entirely unathletic. Well, and that's looking it. entirely unathletic. It's amazing. The man whose only running came at the expense of the neighborhood ice cream truck, who was so unathletic he could not even do a single push-up when he joined the NBA. The two-time reigning MVP of the NBA with the highest player efficiency rating in history, topping even the great Michael Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain. Wow, I did not know that. Nikola Jokic. 1995, born in Sambor, Serbia, which is why it's the Sambor Shuffle. Mm. He has two brothers, both older, both giants. Yep. Sambor sits in the northwestern part of Serbia. And the northwestern part of Serbia is part of an autonomous province called Vojvodin. And the land. The place where Jokic was born, my theory that I'm going to present to you here is that it's, its immigrant story is the more important one. Hmm. Here's Jokic's immigration interview. 1995, he's born. He comes to the NBA probably on a P1 or O1 non-immigrant visa. Right. Okay. Now as the MVP, he has extraordinary ability. He could apply for the EB1 green card and actually become an immigrant. I don't know. For those folks watching, the reason we say international players and not immigrant players is because most international players aren't immigrants. They have non-immigrant visas. Right. And I actually wondered, you know, can everybody get EB1s? If you're just a scrub in the NBA, can you get an EB1? Question for another day. Yeah. Do you have to become an all-star to get a green card? You know? How extraordinary is yeah. your ability? She would yeah. be talking differently about international players. You know, when they make an all-star team, we're like, we're like, oh boy, he's got that green card money. Yeah. You know, he's putting up green card numbers. <laughs> he's putting up green card, you know. Yeah. That'd be funny and probably vaguely racist or not so, but not really. No, but it'd be informed because somebody's like, that's racist. You'd be like, no, I'm talking about the EB1 category visa of extraordinary ability, right. which is handed out those with internationally recognized extraordinary ability. And so, okay. But he's actually probably a non immigrant in the US. Here's the elements of his immigration story. Okay. I'm going to get to it why his land is the most important. But first, his brother played basketball at Detroit Mercy. Yeah. Okay. So his brother was probably here on an F1, which is what most, most college players are, F1 student visa. Yeah. Played at Detroit Mercy. His now wife, she finished a degree at uh, Metro State University in Minnesota. Hmm. Okay. His older brother, whose name is Strachonia, which literally means scary one. Strach is fear and one to be feared. That's too good. Uh, he played basketball in and around Europe and now lives in Colorado with the boys. Okay. And I don't know what their immigration situation would be. You know, like maybe they got petitioned for, but we know that brother petitions take like 14, 15 years. That could so, be another interesting topic is the family. Of, yeah. Uh, family well, well, I bet you, I know what it would be. If he's on an O1 sports visa, they would be on O2 visas helping the O1 person. Mm, okay. That's how you could bring in the family members. He goes O1, mm. they go O2 where they're his assistants. Oh, wow. Interesting. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of like sports visa. Okay. Um, but why is his country interesting? Okay. So we spent first part, part of the episode talking about how your citizenship defines your uh, perception of opportunities elsewhere. How the mere existence of nation states actually bakes in the fact that people are going to move around because some states, frankly, are better than others. Yep. Okay. When it's $247 a year that you're making in Burundi, almost anywhere seems better. Right. Okay. I'm not a moral relativist about that. Yeah. Uh, we also got to touch on the fact that 
your perception of justice may be, well, we didn't touch on it, but I'll touch on it. Your perception of justice can be different depending yeah. on where you're born. You know, I have friends, I have a doctor friend in Croatia, really successful as a company. And he goes, you know, uh, a large part of what I could be was decided by where I was born. Right. You right. And I, this is a hard concept for, um, I really had to think about this for, for a second is, you know, my ability to move, you know, yeah. bodily autonomy, uh, my ability to travel. Um, that is so privileged in this, in this country. There's people who, um, yeah, whose ability to exist as a human being, um, doesn't exist in many countries around the world just because of where they were born. It's let me ask you this. When you realize that you were like a fair haired, blonde haired stud <laughs> that could ride motorcycles in a country free from helmet laws. Mm. And you decided you were just going to travel across a massive continent, which just happens to be a single country on your motorcycle with your shirt off to ride alongside Trump's wall. Did you think to yourself ever, God damn, those Burundians couldn't do this. <laughs> did you ever, did you ever you were like, God damn, it feels good to be an American. Honestly, no, it's like, it's so far. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For, for most of my life, it was so far. Um, I had, I hadn't conceived of that yet. It's like free freedom of movement was just so uh, baked into like my experience of being alive. You know, the, when you go surfing <laughs> in Rhode Island or you go down to Nicaragua in the summer between your stints in this office and you stand, stay in a little thatch hut with a nice little Nicaraguan lady who makes you really simple breakfast and you meet your mm -hmm. surfing heroes while hunting 20 foot waves. Did you ever think to yourself, God damn, it feels good to be an American. Okay. That trip I did. You did. You, should, you did. <laughs> no, I mean, I. Uh, yeah. I'm very. I'm very aware of that when I yeah. when I travel to Central America. Yeah. Honestly. Um, but yeah, it's it's not. Um, it's not baked in. It all depends. It yeah. all depends. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Uh, doesn't matter on much except for your except for your citizenship. So this brings me to Jokic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Jokic is born in Sambor, Serbia. Northern Serbia again, Vojvodina very rural area. It was the front lines of the war, the Yugoslavian wars, which raged from 1991 to 2001 in Serbia. Now they ended mm -hmm. in Bosnia and Croatia in 1995. What the Croatians call the Croatian War of Independence has two phases. The last ends, I think, in April 1995. Bosnia War ends in November 1995, or it might be November. It doesn't matter. It all ends by the end of 1995. The wars in the Balkans, except for Serbia, have ended. Mm. Serbia still has outstanding, uh, has wars that it's going to wage with Albanians in Kosovo. And what happens in 1999, uh, there are all sorts of reports and video of uh, Serbian nationalist uh, forces who still under this time under Milosevic expelling Kosovars, Kosovar Muslims from Kosovo, um, expelling Albanians. So all this stuff is happening in Kosovo. People are getting expelled. Yeah. yeah. And NATO, for the second time ever, uh, decides to unilaterally bomb. Uh, they bombed during the Bosnian War. Thank God mm. that helped where my grandparents weren't sorry about. Thank God, mm. right, that they bombed. Uh, but they bombed Serbia. And they don't just bomb one place in Serbia. They bomb up and down all of Serbia, strategic targets from Belgrade to the outer reaches, including... Sambor, which is a small town, right? Population, what is it? Population can't be more than 40,000. Sambor population, 47,000. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they bomb Sambor, population of 47,000. But it's very rural. 47,000 is pretty big from Serbia. Okay. Right. Pretty big. Okay. Right. Why do they bomb Sambor? First of all, Sambor is at the intersection of Hungary, Croatia, and Serbia, okay? So it's a strategic point, and they were mil there was military there. Yeah. They had two different gas companies, oil companies, had their depots there. Those were bombed. But there's also an intelligence center there where some reports that I've been able to find show that people, Croats and Bosniaks, um, who were taken to concentration camps as prisoners of war, would first be interrogated in Sambor and Novi Sad. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Sambor itself 
has a memorial to fallen soldiers from the Yugoslav wars. So we know that people from there fought. And that would make sense because the most the most violent front lines were along its edges. Hmm. Okay. Vukovar was the greatest massacre of Croatians took place, uh, was is 60 miles south of okay. some, or no, 43 miles south, 60 some kilometers south. 43 miles south. That's the distance from Durham to Raleigh, from Hartford to New Haven. Yeah. All right. That's, that's a small distance. This is where Nikola grows up. Okay. Mm. But not only that, so I'm not, I'm not saying he's a Serb nationalist. Go with me here. Okay. He sits at the intersection of these wars. So he grows up during a time of intense battle and he feels it. And I know his brothers felt it and his father felt it. Okay. All this energy is in the home. It's in the town. Okay. That tension. He is there during the bombing in 1999. So if, you know, you can imagine what a giant depot full of oil getting bombed is going to sound like when it blows up. Right. 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 And I, I hope we can show the video we found of this, uh, uh, of w one place in Sambor getting bombed directly by NATO bombs. There's actually a like, video of it. He experiences that. His brothers experienced probably the frontline warfare, right. right? And what that was like and the deprivation during that period. Yeah. Here is the history of rulers in Sambor. Okay. That being said, so this is at the intersection now of Hungary, Croatia, Serbia. This is a place where there's always been warfare. This is since the birth of Jesus, because okay. the West won the war, the real war, as yeah. Louis C.K., <laughs> who we don't like or love, or we don't like. I don't know. No, Louis C.K. Who we're conflicted about. Who we're conflicted about, I guess. <laughs> All right. Um, here, here's, the, here's the history. The Celts, Celts, then the Romans, then the Goths, then the Gepids. G-E-P-I-D-S, never heard of them. Then the Huns, heard of them. Yeah. The of Avars, haven't really heard of them. Sounds like a condiment to me, like Avar. <laughs> then the Bulgarians. Then the uh, famous country of Monrovia. Then uh, the Byzantine Empire under the Bulgarians. Yeah, all right. Forgot about that then chapter. The, then the Kingdom of Hungary. This is 11 or 1200s. Then the Ottoman Empire. Then there's a Habsburg rule, right? The Habsburg monarchy. And first it's Hungarian crown land, but then it becomes Austrian crown land. Those Hungarian Austrian historians among you can uh, correct me on that. Among all 120 listeners, I'm sure there's one of you. And then uh, the kingdom of Yugoslavia. Okay. Nazis occupy it. And uh, actually they kill all of the Jews. So Serbia is the first Juden free state. And there's wow. a record of Sambor of over 900 Jewish individuals being shipped to Auschwitz or one of the concentration camps. Okay, so that's there. That's Which the land that you live by, in. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, it's, it's, it's farther north, but the, the, po the first, the experiments on liberating, uh, making a country Juden free began in Serbia. Mm. Okay. This has always been the land of uh, terrible experimentation. <laughs> Socialist Yugoslavia and then Serbia. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 17. nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, or 17. Okay, that's a lot of change to a pat map upon which one's house stands. Okay, so imagine you're Jokic. Imagine you could live to be 2,000 year old. If you just stood on the land where you were born and raced your horses, right? and shot basketball, you would have exchanged citizenship identities like 16 times. Okay. So you, he was essentially, he became a, a, a type of, uh, he developed immigrant identity just standing exactly where he was. Mm. And he experienced arguably much of the pain of displacement by being present during bombing. Right. Okay. And so he's this, kid that grows up in this town, which is really small, 47,000 sounds big in a way, but really it's a small town center that you can walk through in three minutes, you know, according to his brother reading the interviews, right? like a lot of these places, and then it's just farmland and forest. Mm. Um, and he, as Serbia is coming back post-war 2001, it remains poor. I have to like just underline how poor Serbia is mm. still, especially in its kind of hinterland. And he makes a life for himself raising horses, but then he, you have to look at the opportunities that he has. There were no jobs in Serbia after the war. 
there are very few jobs now. Most people can leave. He was a good student. He liked going to school. But he and both of his brothers and his wife, who grew up in the same town, all went abroad. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. You talk about where you're born, what kind of opportunities you see. Look at me. Yeah. I went abroad. Yeah. You know, I was part of a Serbo-Croatian home. We couldn't stay anywhere. My dad was in the JNA army when they were purging Croatian officers. Wow. wow. There was no safe place for us to go. And it was like, well, we're going to go abroad. Hmm. And for him, it was like, okay, well, his family said, well, I don't know that. We don't know much about university. I don't know about that. But you guys can play basketball. You know? Yeah. It's not a surprise that Croatia was second in the World Cup four years ago. It's not a surprise that Yugoslavia has world championship teams, Serbia has world championship basketball teams, handball teams. Do you know why? Because there, you either work abroad or you get good at a sport. Yeah. That's the way out. That's the way out. Yeah. Right? There are, you can certainly draw pair. Like, if I look at the NBA, NBA is a black league in the United States. Yeah. But it's also a league full of Serbo-Croatian white guys. Yeah. Yeah. And sure, okay, they're big, but there's big people everywhere. But that's what you do. Right. That's the opportunity. So I look at Jokic, he has his reputation of being a quiet guy. Do you read the Serbian uh, media? It turns out he is a quiet guy, hyper-focused on family. He says all yeah. he wants to do is be a good father and race his horses. Here's the cool thing. So, you know, that has always been an area where there's been a military outpost. Yeah. And in the 1600s, it was famous in the Hungarian Empire and then the Ottoman for having strong horsemen who made up cavalries of these armies. So Jokic is like the son of many generations of warriors. And you look at his brother, Strachonia, who names their kid the one to be feared unless they came from some point of warrior family and he's raising horses. The NBA should be so afraid of this guy. This guy's literally a fucking cavalryman raising horses. He's telling you what he is. He's like, I'm a killer, son. I'm a killer. I'm a quiet killer. I raise horses. <laughs> Who grew up having his homeland bombed and giant petrochemical stations blowing up around him in 1999. You think you're going to shake this guy at the free throw line? <laughs> he's going to make that free throw. You think he's scared to do a half-footed pirouette left, right, over the right shoulder shooting with the left hand? You think that scares him? You think your opinion scares him, America? America, you tried to bomb this fucker and he didn't care. He is a horse-raising son of warriors. <laughs> That's what his immigrant identity is about. Man. I think he's going to win 10 MVPs. I think two's not enough. Yeah. People, you know who else they doubted? Djokovic. The tennis player. Ah, uh, yes. He's never yeah. going to be great as Federer and Nadal. I said, well, Federer and Nadal, first of all, they probably take PEDs. Second of all, my guy is going to take him too. Third of all, I did not think he was going to become an anti-vaxxer. I was disappointed in that. <laughs> That's, that was unfortunate. Yeah. That was unfortunate. Yeah. But you look yeah. at this guy and, and, and he says, listen, I, you know, he had a couple of small controversies um, in the NBA, but his whole goal is to go back to some point. Right. Right? right. Because he says, I find peace there, which is, a, which is an extraordinary thing to say. Considering the history. It's considering a, the history and, yeah. and the immediate history that he went through, but, but home is home for him. And uh, that is a form of, that's a very key part of any immigrant identity. Right? Absolutely. What is one of the statistics that you'll, uh, one of the fact facts you'll, you'll hear s quoted that frequently surprises people. Uh, our population, undocumented population in the U.S., has gone down from 12 and a half million at its peak about a decade ago to about 10 million now. Hmm. Much of which is, a, is attributed to Mexican nationals growing older and going back home. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which highlights this myth that everybody comes to the U.S. really wants to stay here. That is a huge myth. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe you should enjoy that Mexican restaurant that's in your town because it's going to be here for about 15 years. Yep. And you better learn how to cook that food if you want to enjoy it, you know, 30 years from now. Because right. that person rightly, right, loves their home maybe, right? Right. Maybe they were here because there was a flood. Maybe they were here because there was a hurricane like in Guatemala. Maybe they were here because the Zetas cartels took yeah. over everything. And maybe that gets better. Right. Right. And so, guys, let's enjoy this MVP.
from Sombor. Yeah, cheers. To wrap this up, anything you want to say to wrap this up? I'm still just picturing him on one of his war horses at center court. <laughs> warrior. Yeah. Everybody talks about how Garnett's like, I'm a warrior. It's like, no, 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 no. First of all, you would have been a good one. Garnett would have been a good warrior. Berserker. Yeah. But second, <laughs> you're a Celtics fan. I know you appreciate it. Yeah, I know what I'm talking That's about. Good. But, uh, but Jokic. People think he's soft because he raises horses. No, no, those are war horses. Those horses under the Hungarians killed some Ottomans. Under yeah. the Ottomans, they killed some Germans. Yeah. This guy's killing everybody. <laughs> and on that note, that was the second episode of 10 Billion People. We'll see you on the next one. Damien DeNoble, Eli, Frontier Dickwell. <laughs>